Good evening, everybody. It's Sunday evening. You're not seeing an illusion. My habit's in the wash. <laughs> I guess I got a lot of uh, stains when I was out walking the dogs uh, at lunchtime. Lots of marks with them jumping up and down. So, yes, this old monk has some dirty habits. <laughs> so, welcome. And I notice Sister Sue is in with us this evening. And whoever else has joined us, you're welcome. And we're praying with the Celtic holy women from this beautiful little book. And this evening we are with Mary of Nazareth, our Blessed Mother, the Mother of Jesus, for those who are not Christian. Six months later, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town in Galilee near Nazareth to a young woman named Mary. She was engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. Upon arriving, the angel said to Mary, Rejoice, highly favoured one, God is with you. Blessed are you among women. Mary was deeply troubled by these words and wondered what the angel's greeting meant. The angel went on to say to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You'll conceive and bear a son, and you will give him the name Jesus. Deliverance, his dignity will be great, and he will be called the only begotten Son of God. God will give Jesus the judgment seat of David, his ancestor, to rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his reign will never end. So we come to the Pilgrim's Diary and we look at the notes from along the way. Primary among Ireland's Marian shrines is Knock, which also has become one of the world's major Marian shrines. Knock is often called the Lord of Ireland. A steady stream of pilgrims came into the beautiful newly renovated Apparition Gable Chapel the day we were there in September 2000. This chapel marks the spot where Mary, St. Joseph and St. John are reported to have appeared on the church wall in the year 1879. To their right and in the middle of the church wall was a plain altar on which was standing a lamb, the symbol of Jesus. A group of angels hovered about the Lamb, and this apparition has been documented by interviews with the 15 people who saw it. We watched as small groups of pilgrims reciting the Rosary, <coughs> excuse me, walked around this chapel in the ancient tradition of doing the pattern. That is, walking sunwise around a shrine or holy well reciting certain prescribed prayers. Like the invisible Irish mist that often falls gently on this emerald isle, peace and serenity seem to permeate everyone and everything at Mary's shrine. It felt good to be there in that powerful atmosphere of prayer and simplicity of faith. Masses were held on the hour and the Reconciliation Chapel was opened all day. Although there is no holy well at Knock, there are faucets by the wall near the gate which contain holy water, and pilgrims come to fill up their bottles to carry home to family and friends. It is a custom in many Irish families to keep holy water in the house. Some homes still have holy water fonts at the door. In the Means cottage in Ireland, and in their home in the United States, there is a holy water font near the front door to remind the family of God's nearness in their comings and in their goings. <clears throat> Pilgrims through the years have touched a spot on the side wall of the church which they believe was the place that Our Lady appeared. We were greatly moved as we watched older women and men stop 
and kiss this book. Monsignor Dominic Greeley, in his booklet on Knock, the Apparition Gable, notes that shrine officials have now encased in the front wall of the new shrine enclosure an authentic section of the original Apparition Gable, which pilgrims may touch if they so wish. On a number of earlier visits to Ireland, Bridget had visited Knock with her family and her relatives. Her mother, Bridie, had a very close relationship with the Blessed Mother and inculcated that devotion in her children from their earliest years. One of Bridget's first memories is every evening kneeling by the couch next to her brothers Patrick and Sean as her mother led the family in the rosary. It always ended with the trimmings, that is, the litany of the Blessed Mother and the invocation of Mary conceive without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. So when Bridget's family spent holidays in Ireland, Knock was always a favorite stop. After a time of prayer, they always stopped up on holy water for the year. About 10 years ago, Regina and Bridget accompanied Bridget's aunt Molly and a group from Port Lex on a pilgrimage to Knock. This was our first experience of an Irish-style pilgrimage. On the bus trip to and from Knock, the group recited the 15 decades of the Rosary twice. Once there the pilgrims did the pattern <coughs> excuse me, around the stations and the apparition chapel, filled holy water bottles, received the sacrament of reconciliation, and attended Mass at the Basilica. It was quite a spiritual workout, even for two nuns. And here we have a heading, Encountering Our Lady of Knock. At eight o'clock on a rainy Thursday, on August 21st, 1879, 15 people of different ages witnessed the apparition of Our Lady, St. Joseph and St. John the Evangelist, on the south gable of the Church of Knock. Mary Byrne and her brother Dominic Byrne, young people who lived in the village of Knock, were eyewitnesses to the heavenly apparition. Their descriptions of the apparition are recorded in a book titled I Saw Our Lady, published by the custodians of the Knock Shrine in 1995. Mary was about 300 yards <coughs> excuse me, from the church when, according to her testimony, I beheld all at once three figures which on more attentive inspection appeared to be that of the Blessed Virgin, St. Joseph and St. John. The Virgin stood erect with eyes raised to heaven, her hands elevated to the shoulders or a little higher, the palms inclined slightly towards the shoulders or bosom. She wore a crown on her head, rather a large crown, and it appeared to me somewhat yellower than the dress or robes worn by our Blessed Lady. Dominic Byrne, her brother, and also an eyewitness, described the figures as life-sized and standing about a foot from the ground, looking like statues. The Blessed Virgin was in the middle, her face was turned out to us. Her eyes were lifted up in a manner of praying. Saint Joseph was on her right hand side and turned towards her. His hands were joined together and he was stooping. His hair and beard looked grey. On the left side was Saint John. He was dressed in a long robe and had on a mitre. He was turned partly out and partly away from the Blessed Virgin, facing an altar, farther on the left-hand side of the gable. On his left hand, he was holding a large book open. His right arm was lifted up in the form of a blessing. Beside the heavenly figures and, do, and to the right, in the centre of, a ga of the gable was a plain altar on which stood a lamb around with which angels hovered. 
Behind the lamb there was a large cross. The vision remained for two hours, during which time the people present prayed the rosary. Two commissions of inquiry, one in 1897 and one in 1936, found that their testimony of witnesses was trustworthy. Almost immediately numerous healings were achieved as a result of devotion to Our Lady of Knox. Here are some of the first healings reported in a newspaper in September 1880 and recorded in Tom Neary's I Saw Our Lady. Thomas McGann was crippled for 22 years. <clears throat> His right leg could not be straightened or bent and he could not move without a crutch. One day, he went to the priest's house, applied some water from the shrine on his leg, and upon arriving at the church felt a strange sensation in his leg. The coldness in his leg was gone and he left his crutch at the church and walked about half a mile to his home. 29-year-old Margaret Doyle, <coughs> excuse me, of Gull Island suffered from severe asthma attacks for eight years. <coughs> The doctor gave up on her and she had received the last sacraments. Father Hanley, the parish priest, gave her a small quantity of water with a few particles of the cement from the chapel of Na. After the first application of the water, she was completely cured. She reported that the following Sunday she had been able to walk to Mass. Since then she has never had any more symptoms. Patrick Hogan complained of gradually losing his eyesight. It got to the stage in which he could not see objects 800 yards away. After applying the water from Knock to his eyes, the film left his eyes and he could see a lighthouse a great distance away for the first time. In order to understand the significance of the apparition of Our Lady of Knock, it is important to place it in its historical context. In his presentation of the background of Knock, Tom Neary reminds the reader that the west of Ireland was a place of dire poverty and homelessness in the late 19th century. It was a time of hunger, famine, emigration. One Englishman noted the sad state of affairs on his travels through Galway and Mayo. Rents cannot be paid while there is nothing to be earned, and when evictions abound, as they threaten to abound, we shall hear that scores of families are living or dying in dens and caves of the earth. In her book, Women of Celts, Jean Markale notes a resemblance between devotion to Mary and the traditions associated with the Celtic goddess. <clears throat> in fact, on the site where the Chartres Cathedral stands in France is an underground sanctuary in which stands a statue of a mother goddess. The shrine is referred to as Our Lady under the ground. <clears throat> Celtic holy women were virgins. But at the same time, they were symbol symbolic mothers, responsible for the well-being of their people and their lands. Miranda Green, <clears throat> in her book Celtic Goddesses, points out that Mary was a virgin when she became mother of Jesus, and she was also a disciple of her son. The Celtic Goddess... Arian Rod was also known as a virgin and mother and presents a parallel. The legend further portrays Aaron Rod's son, Clu, as reaching a greater status than his mother had attained. Devotion to Mary is as natural and comfortable for the Celtic soul as the fresh air that blows across the cliffs of Moher on the coast of County Clare. 
Although not divine herself, Mary is the most powerful icon or image by which we can experience the mothering side of God. <clears throat> the Celtic soul has cherished the feminine face of divinity from ancient times. Later, when the Celts embraced Christianity, attributes of the goddesses were transferred to the Blessed Mother and the women saints. Quite simply, for centuries, Mary has reflected the loving heart of a mothering God who is nurturer. <coughs> not only nurturer, but comforter and healer. This is the Mary we meet at the shrines, such as Our Lady of Knock. Mary, our universal mother, is a reminder that God, God's tender warm love, always embraces us. And here we have a section called Celebrating the Gifts of Our Lady for Our Lives. By her appearance at Knock, Mary reminds the Irish people and us that God is with them, that God will heal them, that God sees their oppression and will be their vindicator. The promises God made to the Hebrew people long ago are the same promises that God makes to the people in the destitute, poverty-stricken west of Ireland. God will provide a way out. God will raise up courageous men and women who set Ireland free and restore dignity to all her children. God sends Mary as a sign of mercy and hope in a time of darkness and despair. In the end, the people who witnessed the apparition, who knew, and all the people of Ireland knew as well, that Mary's visit meant all would be well because they were experiencing God's intervention, assuring them that they were God's beloved people and one, who one day live in freedom, dignity and prosperity. As the passage in Luke reminds us, the mercy of the compassionate one reaches from age to age. How lovely. <clears throat> we have a lovely opening prayer. Mary, Blessed Mother, reflection of God's warm, mothering love, embrace us this day with the strength, peace and healing we need to reflect the presence of the Holy One in our world. May we be prophetic voices for people of the world who suffer poverty, hunger and oppression, assuring them that they are God's beloved people. May we work for justice and peace around the globe. Flower garland of the ocean, flower garland of the land, flower garland of the heavens, Mary, Mother of God, we praise you, we thank you, we love you. Flower garland of the earth, flower garland of the skies, flower garland of the angels, Mary, Mother of God, we praise you, we thank you, we love you. Flower garland of the mansion, flower garland of the stars, flower garland of paradise, Mary, Mother of God, we praise you, we thank you, we love you. So beautiful is that. And here we have a, type, a section called Scripture, and it will look at the Magnificat that we say in our evening prayers here on live stream. Within a few days, Mary set out and hurried to the hill country to a town of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted her cousin Elizabeth, who also was pregnant and who became the mother of John the Baptist. As soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she proclaimed, 
Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why am I so favored that the mother of the Messiah should come to me? The moment your greeting reached my ears, the child in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who believed that what our God said to her would be accomplished. And Mary said, my soul proclaims the greatness of God, and my spirit rejoices in you, my Saviour, for you have looked with favour upon your lowly servant, and from this day forward all generations will call me blessed. For you, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. Your mercy reaches from age to age on those who fear him. You have shown the strength of your arm. You have scattered the proud of heart in their conceit, and you have deposited the mighty from their thrones and raised the lowly to high places. You have filled the hungry with good things, and you sent the rich away empty. You have come to the aid of Israel, your servant, mindful of your mercy, the promise made to our ancestors, to Sarah and Abraham and their descendants forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Now we're going to share with you the meditation and reflection. If you're still there, I hope you are. In her book, The Friendship of Women, Ari Pennsylvania, Ventivision, 2000. Joan Chichester reflects on the friendship between Mary and Elizabeth. The Elizabeth factor in friendship is a fierce commitment to hold on with hope to the spiritual fecundity of a friend. However dark, however debilitating the circumstances with which the friend may be grappling at the moment, Elizabeth knows that in the end will come goodness because goodness is of the essence of the one we love as we love ourselves. Acceptance is the universal currency of real friendship. It allows the other to be the other. It puts no barriers where life should be. It does not warp or shape or wrench a person to be anything other than what they are. It simply opens its arms to hold the weary and opens its heart to the heartbroken and opens its mind to see the invisible. Then in the shelter of acceptance, a, a person can be free to be even something more. Reflect on times in your life when you experience the acceptance of genuine friendship. Times when you saw your own goodness reflected through the eyes of a friend. Be aware of any feelings or images that arise in you. Give thanks for each friend who has given you the gift of acceptance. <clears throat> Reflect on times in your life when you held friends or a friend in your arms or heart and you've reflected their goodness back to them, especially when they were discouraged, when they were afraid, weary or lonely, when you offered warmth, love and companionship to them. Be aware of any feelings or images that arise in you. Give thanks for each memory. Reflect on Mary as an image of a mothering God, affirming you as an image of divine goodness, holding your spiritual fecundity, encouraging you to grow spiritually. See yourself becoming something more. Be aware of any feelings or images that arise in you. Give thanks for each insight. Imagine yourself as an image of a mothering person, holding, accepting, nurturing, 
supporting and comforting people who are neglected, rejected, wounded, in need of a real friend. Be aware of any feelings or images that arise in you. Give thanks for each insight. And now we come to our intercessions. Console people who are lonely and grieving. Mother of God, love through us. Free those burdened with guilt. Response, Mother of God, love through us. Heal the sick, especially those heavily burdened this day. And let us name individuals or groups now needing our help. Mother of God, love through us. Fill the hungry, shelter the homeless. Mother of God, love through us. Strengthen feet people who feel disempowered. Mother of God, love through us. Deliver abusers from abusing others. Mother of God, love through us. Calm those who worry. Response, Mother of God, love through us. Encourage the despairing, Mother of God, love through us. Guide those who are lost, Mother of God, love through us. Give wisdom to those who are confused, Mother of God, love through us. Transform unjust structures that oppress and dominate peoples and nations. Mother of God, love through us. And we have a closing prayer. <clears throat> Our Lady of Knock, brighter than worlds of sunbursts beaming, fairer than myriads of fair stars gleaming, whiter than floods of moon waves streaming, vision of love, of a pure heart stealing. Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. Thy beauty, the heavens and earth transcending, purer than crystalline dews descending, on the lips of the rose low bending, softer than rays of the rainbow blending, sweeter than incense clouds ascending, Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. In your charms more wonders combining than the mightiest mind in its art defining, Fairer than milk while lilies entwining, their petals of gold round their heart's own lining. Far above mortals are angels divining, Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. Queen of all queens, he speaks thy brow, Virgin of virgins we fervently vow, To thy service each day that our lives will allow, Life of our life, to thee we bow. Joy of our joy, we hail thee now. Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. Consoler of Erin, are you not so? Come in the night and the might of our woe. In the storms that blast and the winds that blow, forsaken of friend, derided by foe, thy mercy give and relief bestows. Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. And now the blessing. This is an ancient prayer that is said when one was going to a healing well. Here we adapt it for our own blessing prayer. As you say this prayer, bless yourself with the holy water and or bless your home with holy water. Feel free to adapt this blessing to bless each room in your house by saying, The shelter of Mary, Mother, be with us in this room. We name the room and bless it with holy water. Holy well, the shelter of Mary, Mother, be near my hands and my feet. Bless your hands and your feet. Wow that I may go out to the well and bring me safely home, and bring me safely home, we bless our home. May warrior Michael aid me, may Bridget come and preserve me, 
May sweet Brianna give me light, and Mary pure be near me, and Mary pure be near me. And now the closing prayer. Here is the earliest litany to Mary, originally composed by Brogan of Clonsas in the old Gaelic language. Respond to each title with pray for us. And it goes on, like Our Lady Queen of Angels, pray for us, Our Lady of the Heavens. It's rather beautiful. And the question for reflection and discussion is our final contribution. Number one, what would be your most significant petition were you to make a pilgrimage to the shrine of Our Lady of Nam? Two, what strategies could be used to achieve in our own lives a closer reflection of God's healing love? And three, in what ways has Mary been a reflection of God's mothering love? And fourthly, how can you be an image of a mothering God, affirming your own spiritual fecundity and divine goodness? In what ways do you mother people in need of nurture and comfort? So let us now just bring it to an end. And I've never been to Nock. I've heard a lot about Nock. But let us just for a moment go and visit the gable end of this church wall, a very old church in the 1800s. And there was a lot of poverty in Ireland then, the potato famine, thousands dying, real poverty, real despair. And then suddenly, it's late at night, and you've had a long day working in the fields, supporting your mom and dad, and you just happen to pass the church, and there's a little slipway that you cut through the churchyard to take the shortcut to your own little farm nearby and as you're going through this field you don't feel afraid though it's dark you can hear the owls and at times you can feel the bats flying overhead catching your hair and then you look to the left and you see this light and you're thinking it's not a light bulb And curiosity gets the better of you and you are drawn to the gable end of the church wall and as you get closer and closer you see three life-size figures one you recognize almost immediately and that is of the Blessed Virgin Mother Mary she's resplendent and beautiful she is the Queen of Heaven with a crown on her head and the most beautiful cloak in pearls and diamonds. And she's looking at you and the look draws you closer and closer till you're almost touching the gable end of the church wall. But out of reverence you kneel down because your heart is exploding with so much love that you're seeing the mother of your God. And to her right is Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, the carpenter, who's an old man now. To the left of Mary, which would be your right, you see a young man, resplendent, dressed like a bishop with the mitre and crozier, and it's none other than St. John the Evangelist, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he too is looking at you, but he's looking at you with love. 
And as you kneel looking at the Blessed Mother, you see a table before her and there's a lamb with a cross and a banner. And the lamb symbolizes Jesus. The lamb led to the slaughter, the Paschal lamb. But all of a sudden you become aware of a choir of angels singing. And on the church wall, yes, you see the great archangel princes, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, Uriel, Metatron, Israel, Moroni, Aziel. They're all there. And the peace, the serenity, and the joy is electric. And you feel utterly blessed. And you lift your arms up in complete adoration of being in the presence of God. And the angels take you by your arms and lift you up to Mother Mary. And she places her arms around you. She blesses you and she thanks you for taking the shortcut home and she asks you to go and tell others to live in peace and to pray each day especially for those who refuse to acknowledge yourself. Suddenly, you look up, you look up, and they've gone. All you see is the darkness of the church wall. But there's a beautiful fragrance in the air, and it's the fragrance of Michael's incense. And you go running home, but you're afraid to tell your mom and dad in case they give you a good hiding. And that inner voice tells you, say nothing. Let's keep this a secret for now. When you feel ready, open your eyes, relax, be still, and know your and know the peace of God is in your life and in your heart. Be still now. Be still. And thank you for joining me on this Sunday evening here in the UK. It's our bank holiday weekend. And tomorrow evening we come to the beautiful Celtic saints, the pioneer saints of Wales. And the first one is Saint Non, icon of holy birthing. And that is tomorrow. But for now, I want you to have a wonderful evening and enjoy the rest of your bank holiday. So namaste, God bless, shalom.